Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 201. Writing is easy. All you have to do is cross out all the wrong words. Mark Twain. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my indie film hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Video Blocks. Now, guys, when I was shooting my show for Legendary Pictures, uh, and I did that 96 pages in four days, I actually got into post and we used a lot of stock footage, stock sounds, and even some uh, graphics from Video Blocks. They are an amazing resource. With your membership, you are granted the rights to use that footage forever in perpetuity on any projects you want to. So if you want to try a seven-day free trial, and by the way, anything you download during those seven days is yours to keep. And if you decide to stay, you get 84% off the yearly membership. It is well worth it, guys. Trust me, if you do a lot of production, it is something you really need. So just head over to videoblocks.com forward slash hustle. And today's show is also sponsored by Masterclass and specifically the new directing Masterclass by Oscar-winning director, Ron Howard. Ron Howard has grossed over $1.9 billion at the box office and has made Oscar-winning movies like The Da Vinci Code, Cinderella Man, Apollo 13, and The Beautiful Mind, just to name a few. And his master class, which I've been able to, to watch already and, and take, was amazing. It was just so insightful, and it's a must for any film director or any filmmaker who wants to direct the knowledge bombs that he drops are amazing. So just head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash Ron Howard. So I want to say happy Thanksgiving, happy Turkey Day to all of my U.S. listeners out there. This is going to be a short week. There's going to be one podcast this week because I gave you three last week and four the week before. So I think I deserve a slight break for the holiday. But don't despair because today's episode is pretty amazing. It's all about story mapping and how you break down story and how you can model other successful stories to your own stories. And today's guest is author Dan Calvisi, and he wrote the book on story maps. Literally, he has a book called Story Maps, How to Write a Great Screenplay. Then he also does dramas. He also breaks down Christopher Nolan's work. And Dan has read thousands of screenplays over the course of his career. He was a story analyst for a bunch of major studios like 20th Century Fox, Miramax, New Line Cinema, uh, and, and a bunch of stuff. He's got a lot of great content. And I wanted to bring him on the show to kind of go through this aspect of screenwriting and how you model other successful stories. And it's something I do all the time in every aspect of my, my life uh, is model successful blueprints of other things that you're trying to achieve, whether that be podcasts, whether that be films, by watching other filmmakers make their films, and you can build upon what you've seen before to create your own unique product or film or service or whatever you're trying to do. It's invaluable for you to understand how to model successful blueprints. And Dan's uh, Story Maps is a really great starting point for that. So without any further ado, here is my conversation with Dan Calvisi. I'd like to welcome to the show Dan Calvisi, man. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it, man. So I wanted to first get into how'd you get into this crazy business? Well, I went to NYU film school and like everyone there, I wanted to be a writer director. And, but I really uh, got into screenwriting there. I really found that the screenplay was, was really where my heart was. And I took a, um, a script analysis class that I really liked. So that was kind of the first time I ever really took apart like professional scripts, uh, their structure and everything we studied, you know, Sunset Boulevard and The Silence of the Lambs and really a wide swath of scripts and movies. So that really turned me on. And I heard about this job of being a reader. So when I got out of college, I found my way to becoming a reader for various companies like Miramax mm -hmm. and Fox 2000. And I worked for Jonathan Demme's company clinic, Aesthetico mm -hmm. and New Line and other things. So that was freelance reader work that I was doing, but I was working for enough companies where I was supporting myself. And I learned on the job, you know, quickly I had to, cause they give you a bunch of scripts and you have to return them two days or maybe the next day, you know, maybe do an overnight job. Mm -hmm. 
So I had to do written analysis of all of these scripts and a lot of books as well. And so I really learned uh, under fire and I started, of course, finding patterns and similarities in the bad scripts and the good scripts and seeing what worked and what didn't, especially uh, structure. Mm-hmm. And that's how I started to develop my story maps uh, structural method as well. So, so how do, so how does a young screenwriter uh, break into Hollywood as a script reader? Like, what's that process like? Well, I think pr- these days probably um, hone your craft a little bit, get your feet wet with contests, mm-hmm. um, with contests and film festivals. Mm-hmm. They probably won't pay you at first, so I would say do some free reader work. You know, um, reviewing the first round of submissions to, uh, you know, the Austin Screenwriting Conference or something like that Mm -hmm. or the final draft contest. So contact them directly. Say you want to volunteer to be a reader. Hopefully they'll give you a test script to do uh, test notes on and confirm that you do know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Then from there, I would say it'll either be word of mouth. You'll hear about an opening or contact directly agencies Uh, management companies, production companies, and studios. And if you contact enough and you send them in sample coverages, hopefully eventually um, there will be an opening and they will hire you for that. I got uh, my, one of my first jobs, the way I got into Miramax films was through their uh, genre unit dimension films. This is, and then you got in at a time when Miramax was at the height of its powers. Yeah, they were absolutely at their peak. They were winning Best Picture. Um, and I. this was Dimension Films. They had the Spy Kids franchise, the Scream franchise. Yeah, they were huge. Yeah, they were huge. And it was funny because I was told by a friend that he had been a reader there. He knew a guy there, but he said, don't call him because I know for a fact that they don't have any openings. Mm-hmm. And so I called him anyway, the guy at Dimension. And the first thing he said was, we have an opening for a reader. Do you want to test for it? <laughs> so the lesson there is be persistent. You know, somebody tells you not to do something. As long as you're not a jerk about it, go ahead and try and get your foot in the door. It doesn't hurt to make a phone call. That's one thing I always tell people is, you know, people still make phone calls in this town. Mm-hmm. So um, cold calling can work. You know, it's it's pretty remarkable, uh, you know, doing this show for so long. I, I cold I, I don't cold call. I cold tweet uh, or I cold email like I did to you. Uh, mm-hmm. And it's amazing. Uh, you know, you ask and people will like, yeah, sure. I'll come on. Yeah. Or sure. Yeah. I'd like to have a meeting. Sure. It's it's mm-hmm. fascinating when you ask what happens. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So. What- yeah. And I find one thing it's hard to do, but if you can give them something like a piece of information they may not have had, mm-hmm. or if you can stroke their ego too, um, maybe in a unique way, like let's say you're contacting a company that makes a lot of big blockbuster movies, mm-hmm. but you're talking to an executive who happened to have made this really small indie film 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. And you tell them, Hey, Oh my gosh, I saw that film. I really loved it. You know, I'd love to learn more about it. Cause you're, you know, you're kind of appealing to them, to their passion, you know, not mm-hmm. just their, their latest superhero movie, which they may not have had anything to do with, you know? Yeah. That's something. And now with IMDb, you can literally do that research fairly quickly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, yeah. And do you agree that when you are reaching out to, to gatekeepers or, or people that you're trying to work with in one way, shape or form, uh, providing value of some sort is a, or stro- like you said, stroking the ego is one way. Uh, in, but also providing some sort of value uh, in whatever that yeah. might be, whether that be free work, whether that be anything. Do you think that's a, a good rule of thumb? Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. If you can offer them something, because because I mean, really, they get if they're getting twenty scripts a day, they don't really need your script, you know, or your whatever you're trying to send to them. You know, they don't need to give you your break. So. If you can somehow offer them something of value, you know, a piece of information or um, I don't know anything, uh, maybe a, a bottle of their their favorite barbecue sauce from Brooklyn. You know, mm-hmm. if you do that kind of research, I guarantee you, if you do that kind of research and you hit up an executive and that they you that you found the favorite barbecue sauce and you're like, hey, I heard mm-hmm. this was your favorite. It could be a little creepy, but yet it could yeah. open the door. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. Totally. Um, I also find. um if you if you see them talk on a panel, mm-hmm. 
it helps to say, hey, I saw you talk on this panel and I really liked what you had to say, you know, and then given a specific example, because, mm -hmm. you know, people go to talk on panels because they want to be listened to, you know, mm -hmm. and they want to be adored and they want to, uh, you know, feel like they made a difference in somebody's life. Mm -hmm. So they may not have actually talked. Maybe they had to leave quickly. So they didn't talk to anyone in the audience or maybe they were only approached by annoying people after their talk, you know? Oh, God, yes. So, you, <laughs> as we all know, there's there's always that person in the front row who just has the most inane questions, right? Oh, at any God. Kind of Q &A. Like, yeah, like, um, how do you get $100 million to make my first feature? I'm like, oh, Jesus. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> you can show, you know, say something really smart and say, you know, you got some value out of their thing, then that sounds really nice to them. You know, they're glad that they did it. So what's the big difference between a script reader and a story analyst in, in regard or are they the same thing in the studio system? They're the same thing in the studio system. Mm -hmm. um, outside the studio system, I would say uh, a story analyst is probably more of a consultant like me, a writing coach, mm -hmm. and also someone who feels comfortable analyzing any kind of narrative, whether it's a book, um, a movie, a TV show, or a video game, you know, or a myth or something like that. So that's something I, I like that term story analyst because it's kind of a universal thing saying I have years of experience analyzing narratives and, um, you know, taking apart the structural differences between, let's say, a fairy tale and a studio feature film, you know, so I analyze story. What are some of the common traits you see uh, since you've read so many, <clears throat> since you've read so many stories and screenplays, what are some mm -hmm. of the common traits you see of successful screenplays? Wow. Well, um, well, I always say you got to come right out of the gate and suck in the reader. So your opening has to be great. Um, open with something unique, ideally something we haven't seen before, or something that really endears us to your main characters. Um, they need to have really strong motivation that we identify with them and they have a really strong need. That's one thing that you just don't see enough in scripts and in movies as well. You mm -hmm. know, um, someone, an actor being a movie star is not enough anymore. To gain my, <laughs> yeah. And not just at the box office, just when you're watching a film to gain my interest in following them. If their character is a total jerk and just an immoral person, um, they still need a code of ethics that we believe in. They still, we still need to believe in their goal um, and root for them, you know? And so, so that can be tough to generate, that rooting interest in the reader or the audience. Can you give an example of a movie that did it right? Like th that opening, I mean, I'm thinking off the top of my head, like Shawshank or Die Hard or Lethal Weapon mm -hmm. or these kind of characters. Do you, do you know of a, 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 or can you come up with a movie that, has that kind of opening, like you really just fall in love with that character and that character, the leading character has that need? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. I mean, I mean, there's so many. Um, the classic example is Raiders of the Lost Ark. You mm -hmm. know, we see this guy do this amazing thing where he rescues this, uh, you know, golden idol from from this temple. And then it's and then it's taken from him by by this evil guy so we really we really uh you know feel for him and then he makes this dashing escape so um so and i think that 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 was necessary in that opening to have a uh, belloc the villain mm -hmm. you know so we don't just think okay this is just a random archaeologist who's just trying to get this golden idol because it's worth a lot of money you know you needed the villain to come in there and say hey you know i'm i'm the evil guy who who wants this for myself you know, whereas you're, you're the pure one. Um, but trying to think of a more, uh, a more modern film, I would say, well, let's look at this summer. There was the, uh, Spider-Man homecoming, mm -hmm. you know, we do feel for Peter Parker because he's a kid mm -hmm. and he doesn't really know what he's doing. And he's struggling with, you know, kid stuff. Like he likes the pretty girl mm -hmm. and, um, she won't give him the time of day, although she does kind of like him too much. That was one thing about it. I thought it was kind of too easy for him to get the girl. She kind of already liked him. But um, so, and that's something with like superhero movies, you still have to endear us to the character, especially even more because they have these superpowers. Right. So they could be just a superhero, not a regular person. But so in Spider-Man, 
he was a normal kid with normal problems. Yeah, I thought and that yeah, was yeah, really th- intentional on their part. I think they did a. Fant- I mean, out of all the Spider-Man movies, I think they nailed. And I do like the Tobey Maguire first and second one, but I felt that that in Spider-Man: Homecoming, they nailed the comic book Spider-Man. That mm-hmm. he was a kid with. Yeah. I mean, it literally yeah. almost turned into a John Hughes movie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, when you're watching it, you just feel like this. Really emotional attachment to his kid problems. Oh, and by the way, he's also fighting villains and and dealing with mm-hmm. his form of puberty, which is uh, superpowers. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, and he's not he's not that powerful yet. You know, he's still figuring out his superpowers and making mistakes. So right, which was in- endearing. So you, you know, he doesn't just come mm-hmm. out and he's perfect right away. Mm-hmm. Uh, and especially with a character that we have such history with, I think they did a fantastic job. But that's a really good uh, a really good example. Now, what are some of the common mistakes? you see screenwriters make uh, again and again? Well, speaking of openings, you have the slow opening Mm -hmm. um, that just doesn't suck in the reader. It starts with maybe too much exposition. That's one. Um, Description that explains too much and it's too wordy. Those, you know, canyons of description, that black ink on the page, those Mm -hmm. super big paragraphs. That's just death to a reader, you know? Mm -hmm. That's a reason why they're going to stop reading the description and start reading only the dialogue, which Mm -hmm. I always tried not to do. But it's your job as the screenwriter to make them want to read the description, Mm -hmm. you know, to come out of the gate because they're going to read everything. Let's say the first few pages, you know, there's that bleary eyed reader who's up at 4 a.m. and they've already read three scripts that day and they're cracking your script and they don't. The last thing they want to do is read another script. Right. So. Firstly, you don't want it to be 127 pages because they don't want to read that much. They're getting paid the same amount of money to read the 127 page script as they are to read the 95 page script. Mm -hmm. So if you can keep it lean and mean, that's great. Keep it in that 95 to 110 page range. Um, And then if you uh, there. So no matter the length, they're hopefully going to read at least the first two to five pages, you know, description and dialogue. Mm-hmm. So it's your job in those opening pages to have such great, lean, terse, descriptive description that really captures tone and mood and really makes them want to uh, enter this world and explore this world with your lead character and then endear us to their character. I hate to say it, but that save the cat moment. Mm-hmm. Blake Snyder was brilliant in identifying that, you know, that moment where we really do connect with the main character. And we really do um, root for them, that rooting interest. So if you can nail that in the opening pages, that's great. Um, that overall length is huge. Uh, having a really strong midpoint halfway through mm-hmm. that um, really ups the, the stakes and the conflict and launches a new through line, unforeseen through line that's going to push to the end of the script. Mm-hmm. You know, a disaster that we didn't see coming. Right. And then, of course, hitting all hitting all those those great signpost beats, you know, along the way. Right, and those are and that, that would, would leads me to my next question. What is the structure that professional screenwriters use as a general statement? Well, I call it the story map, and okay. it's my estimation is ninety five percent of commercial movies use this structure because mm-hmm. um, pretty much hundred percent of movies that I study, and I've studied a wide swath of them and read a lot of professional scripts use this structure. It's always in the same order. So I'm not, you know, mixing and matching and placing beats all over the place, Mm -hmm. but to just mention the titles, excuse me, the titles of my beat sheet, my story maps beat sheet, it would be the opening inciting incident, strong movement forward, end of act one turn and decision, first trial, first casualty, midpoint, Uh, declaration of war slash assumption of power, end of act two, turn and decision. And it's important to end those acts on a turn and direction and a decision that propels us and the main character into the next act. Mm -hmm. And then now we're in act three and we have the true point of no return, the climax and the epilogue. And you want to end as soon after that climax as possible. So obviously there's a lot of, lot of characteristics that go with those beats. Mm Mm-hmm. But those are just the rough titles just to, you know, get you thinking in that direction. Now, and this, and this is a structure that you found that most professional scripts, about 95% of the scripts written in Hollywood use. 
Good ones, yes, professional good ones, and there there are professional bad ones as well. So um, then, so and I always like using this when I have when I have a, a screenwriting uh, expert or or story analyst on the show. I always like to bring up the the, the script of Pulp Fiction and mm-hmm. what a genius uh, script it was. And a lot of people feel that that script was not in the conventional beats, but because the story was thrown all over the place, uh, out of order. Mm-hmm. But from my understanding, it did actually hit all those beats in a weird way, and that was the genius of that script. Do you agree with that? And what's your what's your analysis of that script? Well, I haven't seen it in a long time. <laughs> right. I don't know. <clears throat> I'm guessing that it does hit every one of the beats. But the the overriding point to make is that even if a story is told nonlinear, out of narrative order it still should hit the beats, you know? Mm-hmm. So uh, an example I know better would be Memento. Oh, God, um, yes. Because I, I broke down Memento um, in my book, Story Maps, the films of Christopher Nolan, because mm-hmm. I'm a, obsessed with Christopher Nolan. As you should be. And, as I should be, <laughs> yes. Um, and so in Memento, obviously, it's told in this crazy backward structure. It's not quite backward. It's, uh, it you know, it has its own unique thing going on. It's kind of a, Horseshoe structure is, is what he called it. Mm-hmm. Um, but even though it's told backwards, quote backwards, it still hits all of those beats, you know, the inciting incident and the strong movement forward and the end of act one and all those things. Um, it's just the order that it's told, it hits those beats. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. <clears throat> and that, that <throat> movie is, I mean, if you're a young screenwriter, I mean, to watch, to try to break down or try to analyze that movie would, will, will screw with your head. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think you should yeah, probably I think go. It, all, it, it almost killed us when we, when we were doing that. Um, it, it's, it's just such a – well, he's such an amazing filmmaker and screenwriter and storyteller that he's mm-hmm. on a different level playing field than the rest of us. Well, he's, you know, he's saying, uh, how can I make this different? You know, like he just, he just had Dunkirk this summer and Mm -hmm. instead of telling an absolutely straightforward, historical, epic biopic war film, he said, how can I make this different? So he, he did a triptych structure Mm -hmm. where he was telling the sea, air and land story. Mm -hmm. And he decided for better or worse that he was not going to give any real context to the battle. He was going to throw us into it and give us that, you know, ground level view of the grunt, the troop, the the troops view of the Mm -hmm. situation. So if they didn't know much, we didn't know much either. Mm -hmm. And he told it out of order. There was that moment where you realized it came together, where you realized that it was told slightly nonlinear, you know, because you had the um, the boat. The boat sequence was one day. Mm hmm. The sequence on the beach with the mole Mm -hmm. was one week. And then the aerial sequence with with Tom Hardy in the planes was one hour. But they all did converge at a certain point. I think probably probably the 75 minute mark. Yeah, no spoilers. No spoilers. Okay, no problem. (laughs) Um, But anyway, you the without any spoilers, it's you realize the true structure. Well into the film, you know what I mean. And since we're on, since we're on Christopher Nolan, I'm such a huge fan of his as well. What do you feel is his best screenplay and film? Wow! Um, if you had to pick one, that's really tough. Uh, it's tough. It would be between Memento, The Prestige, and I would have to say Inception over The Dark Knight. The Dark Knight's amazing, but he wrote and directed Inception, right? He wrote and directed Memento. All right. Um, wow. Inception is 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 it, it's such a unique film. It, it, yeah. It, it's yeah. it's basically the biggest budget uh, independent film. <laughs> oh, you think so? Yeah, because of the concept. Mm-hmm. I mean, look at the look what yeah. he's trying to do. It does take big broad strokes. You need big. You need a big brush with that movie. You can't do that on an independent level. But to tell that story inside of a studio system is is pretty remarkable. The last person I could even think of ever doing something like that would be Kubrick, you know, mm-hmm. and what he used to do constantly with every one of his movies inside the studio system. And I think uh, Nolan is one of those guys right now that is probably the closest thing to a Kubrick we have. 
uh, mm-hmm. currently in cinema. Do you, would you agree with that statement? I would say, well, I, I like to say he's our modern day Spielberg just because he works with big budgets. He mm-hmm. makes popular films with universal themes, mm-hmm. but with incredible directing and visuals, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, he's a little bit more, I guess, cerebral than Spielberg was in his, in his period when he was, you know, in his forties as, as Christopher Nolan. So basically Kubrick and Spielberg had a kid and it's, it's Nolan. Yes. And, it's Nolan. <laughs> exactly. and he's British and he always wears dashing clothing and he looks very dapper. Yes, he, he does. I actually, I actually met him once at, uh, in the back. Oh, wow. I met him in the back lot of, uh, Warner brothers and, uh, he is, he's always got a suit on. He wow. has no phone, does not care to have, he's not on any, he doesn't have email. Yeah, that's crazy. He he does everything through his wife, and who's his producing partner, and she is he she's like, look, if something's important, it'll get to me, and that's wow. how, and he goes I have, that way. I have more time to work, and more time to tell stories. I was like, wow, that's uh-huh. so amazing. But he's in a different he's in a different world than the rest of us are. I think in many mm-hmm. ways. Yeah. So um, back back to our interview. Uh, what is uh the what's more important in your opinion, structure or character? Which is the ultimate question. <laughs> in screenwriting. Wow. Or are they both combined the same? What, what do you think? Well, huh. It's funny. Well, the great structure doesn't really matter if we don't believe in and root for your character and want to follow them, you know? Right. So I like to say character equals action because characters are defined by action. And then, of course, the structure is the form in which you put their actions into. It's not formula. It's form. Mm -hmm. It's the shape of the story. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I guess I would say if I had to say I would say structure. If you're talking about unforeseen actions taken by characters, surprise, you know, surprising us within the traditional classic structure. Um, we don't want to be able to predict the beats, you know, we don't want to be able to predict, predict the turns. It has to still be surprising and that's good writing. Got it. But, you know, character, wow, I I guess it's, I mean, you uh, can't, you can't root for structure. You root for character. Yeah. Yeah. But I, if I really was pressed, I would say structure because that would mean an intriguing, surprising story that's compelling, you know? God, I, um, I, I, I probably feel that I would probably feel that they're both without the structure. You get you, you, you. I mean, can you have a movie with great characters and very loose, loosey goosey structure and still be successful? Yeah, I think you could. You know, if if we want to turn the page, if we if we just really want to follow these characters. Uh-huh. Um, I mean, Pulp Fiction is a good example. Pulp Fiction. If you really wanted to get nitty gritty, you could probably cut ten to twenty minutes from it. You mm-hmm. know, and still have the same story. It's definitely an auteur film Mm -hmm. that was made by a director who loved his dialogue and loved his characters and was willing to, to spend time with them, you Mm -hmm. know, Mm -hmm. just sit and hang out with them. Um, but the editor in me and the script analyst in me (laughs) would like to cut time from that and pretty much cut time from almost every Tarantino film. (laughs) Yes. He does. He does talk about it sometimes. He, He does enjoy uh you know his his dialogue and and storytelling a little bit too much at sometimes you know i would i would i would agree with you as a critique of, of tarantino if there's anything sometimes he just goes a little too far and i think mm-hmm. he's gotten worse over the years like hateful eight i thought he really let that go a little too much in my opinion mm-hmm. but uh but he's still i mean he's a once in a generation kind of filmmaker yeah yeah he's still absolutely unique and and uh you're not gonna see anyone who's like him. You know, I didn't see hateful eight. I, I was to the point where I'm to the point where I almost feel like I, I, I don't want to be tricked by him anymore <laughs> into watching, you know, ridiculously long, um, dialogue scenes and overly violent scenes. You know, I, I just, I think he, he almost is gleeful in his violence and it, it goes past, I what you. it really needs to be, you know, but he's got millions of fans and they love him. So, yeah. So that's, and I'm looking forward to seeing his, his Chuck Manson film. That should be interesting. Yeah. Wow. That should be interesting. <laughs> so well, I see, I, I will say one thing about Tarantino, which is a good, exa- which is a good lesson to 
screenwriters mm-hmm. is he he usually makes movies about movies or s- straight genre films mm-hmm. that don't necessarily give us a lot of insight into the human condition. Mm-hmm. And that's my main problem with his, him is I don't really know what he cares about in the world. You know, I don't really know who Quentin Tarantino is. I don't really get universal themes from him other than making, you know, like let's say the Kill Bill movies, for example, I really Mm -hmm. enjoy the Kill Bill movies and they're really cool Kung Fu operas, Mm -hmm. you know, but I'm not taking away much about the human condition. I'm not really that invested beyond, uh, watching a cool revenge story. But I think, I think, I think that Tarantino, and this is just my humble opinion. I think Tarantino's point of view is that he, his movies are a complete reflection of who he is, which is that video store guy who loves movies and thinks of, thinks of cinema as a religion. And he's not really interested in delving into the human condition. He's more interested in delving into cinema. And he is as pure of a cinema cinematic uh, director as I've ever seen in in the history of cinema because he re- you're right he does all his films you know after you watch Django Unchained there's really not a lot to discuss a little bit maybe about the human condition but generally you know Kill Bill uh, Hateful Eight these are all cinematic operas uh, yeah. about yeah. cinema or about the making of cinema so i think that's So are you saying i mean are you saying not in a bad way that he's a shallow person who only cares about movies because that's probably accurate, right? I mean, no, I think uh, – look, I think his entire world um, revolves around cinema. I mean everything mm-hmm. in his life is cinema, has been for – since he was a child and so ever since – definitely since he was in, the vi- in that video store. Me being a video store clerk for four years, uh, I feel him. Uh, I, <laughs> I, underst- I understand that completely. But I, I think that that is his religion. That honestly, cinema is his religion. And whether it's shallow or not, it's his point of view. And it's such a unique point of view that there is literally no one else out there on the planet on planet Earth that has Tarantino's perspective on anything. So it, whether it's shallow or not, that's that's opinion, but mm-hmm. that he really lives for cinema completely he will die with celluloid wrapped around him I'm, but that's but that's who he is and that's what he mm. wants to do i mean he owns the beverly here theater that only shows 35 millimeter here in la he has an insane 35 millimeter print collection like who has i mean i know scorsese does but you know but like who has the the collection like his collection will be an archive Mm-hmm. Of, because there's movies that he has and nobody else has. I remember listening to a story that um, is, it, is it Wizza or I forgot who it was. I think it was Wizza from Wu Tang when he was uh, scoring Kill Bill. Told him, "Oh man, I got this kung fu movie. I just got it on VHS. It's super rare." He's like, "Yeah, that's nice. I got the 35 print." Wow. And he's like, "Whoa, okay, so I'm on a different playing field here." But that's who he is. So I, I think that. But think about. I- and, and this is, I know this is, we're getting off in a no, tangent, no, go, but no, let's go, 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 go. what if you had a painter who only painted referential works to other painters at one point, wouldn't you want to say, well, what's, what's you, what is it about you that you want to put into these paintings or what are you saying really about the world? I, I, I agree. Or does with it you. not matter because there's already a million other painters that are doing that? Well, there, there's a difference between painting and cinema because cinema has so many more elements involved with just a painting. So if yes, I had a painter that – I mean if you had a painter that just kept rehashing Annie Hall uh, – not Annie, uh, Annie Hall, um, uh, Warhol and Basquiat and Van Gogh mm-hmm. and all these guys and just kept putting his – that wouldn't be as interesting. It might be for a little bit. It wouldn't be that interesting. But the wealth of cinema that there is, and the the masters of the different masters of art that you need to to be master of, uh, the different kind of art forms that you have to be a master of to be a, a filmmaker, is uh, so so vast and deep that for someone mm-hmm. like him, he could continue to make movies forever and never get boring because of that that de- and then he also has that knowledge. I mean, he has that encyclopedic knowledge of every movie he's ever seen. It, you know. Okay. Well, here's okay. Then here's my conclusion. Yes. I want to see him do other genres. 
I want to see him do a character drama. I want to see him a do comedy. I love to a see romantic a comedy. Yes, you know. God, can because you imagine if he a truly Tarantino is, romantic. if he truly is a student of all cinema, not mm-hmm. just action films, thrillers, mm-hmm. exploitation films. You know, I want to see him go on to try some really different things. You know, I would I think agree. That would be really fascinating. I would agree with you, and I think he has kind of. He has stuck to a little bit of, of of same genre films, and but he has in recent years kind of moved on. To, I mean, he did the western. He loved the western so much that he did uh, Hateful Eight, and you can argue Django obviously is a, is, is a form of western, but it more black exploitation. So he is going to different genres within the genre world within his likes and dislikes. I'm c- really curious to see what he does with um uh the Manson murders like that. Mm-hmm is insane i can't i mean and he wants brad pitt to play manson <laughs> wow oh my god you know so i'm really curious to see where he goes but that's the thing that how many filmmakers can you say i'm curious to see what he does next there's very yeah, few yeah. filmmakers out there like that in today's world and uh he's one of those guys so uh i'm glad that we've gone on a complete tarantino tangent <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, i think it's so, so- i would say to bring it back to screenwriting yes. um a good thing that he does is he does focus mostly on genre films, you know? Yes. Um, the thriller, the action, kung fu, westerns. Exploitation. Um, at least for his exploitation, at least for his last, like, you know, three or four films. Mm-hmm. And for a screenwriter, if you're looking to break in by selling spec screenplays, it's good to focus on a genre. You know, you're the thriller guy. You're the, the horror guy. You're the romantic comedy a uh, woman, you know, whoever, um, whatever your genre is, write five or six scripts in that genre. And maybe by the time you get to the fourth or fifth, you have something that's really, really ready for submission and could really uh, establish you and get your foot in the door, you know. So you do suggest that screenwriters stick within a genre at the beginning so they could be because if you got a, a screen, mm-hmm. I know that's a, that's like the common mistake a lot of screenwriters make is in their they write five screenplays but they're a comedy a drama a horror a thriller to show range and mm-hmm. that's wonderful but that's very difficult for an agent to sell yeah 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 definitely yes. um i would say write you know be willing to write different genres to find yours that you're best at you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but if you're if you come out of the box and like you love horror that's your passion and that's pretty much all that you want to write um it's okay to stick to horror, you know? Right. And, and be, and then eventually you either get locked into that horror or you move into something else, but at least you're in the, you in, you're in, you're in the business at this point, you're making yeah, a living. Yeah. And then if you want to go off and make something else, you can go off and make something else later. But like, yeah. you know, Sorkin and, and all these big uh, screenwriters that, you know, they were in one form, but then they started to branch out into, mm-hmm. uh, you know, like Charlie Kaufman for God's sakes. <laughs> mm-hmm. Did you ever read, yeah. I mean, I'm sure you've studied Charlie's work, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I've definitely seen his films and, um, I th- I'm trying to think if I've read any of his scripts. The, uh, the beans- just casually, I didn't read any on the job, but okay. I, I did, uh, you know, I have read them he's, on my own. He's pretty amazing. <laughs> He's a pretty mm, pretty yeah. amazing screenwriter. Now, what is the difference between a protagonist in a fil- a feature film versus a television pilot? Hmm. Well, a feature film, the big difference between a feature film and a TV show is that closed ending, that a feature film has a closed ending. Mm-hmm. So it's that it's that beginning, middle, and end, and it does end, and it's a satisfying story unto itself, whereas a TV pilot has to have some kind of open ending, some kind of cliffhanger that makes you want to come back for more, you know, as far as the main character goes, I would say probably the, um, the TV main character has more emotional baggage, which may not be, we may not, and probably shouldn't see all of it in the pilot. Mm -hmm. So there's still stuff left to come that you can explore in the rest of season one and then season two, three, four, et cetera. Um, so there's going to be more complexity and emotional baggage that will come out over time. I would say a nice sense of mystery also about your main character really, um, really helps, you know, um, even if there's something that, you know, like, let's say in scandal, we know that she had a, we know that she had a, an affair with the president of the United States. He actually says that he's still in love with her. 
but we don't know the particulars. We don't know, well, how did they meet, you know, um, how far did their relationship go? Where are they at at this point? Did they break up at some point? Does the wife actually know? Does anyone else know? So we're just hinting at that. Mm -hmm. And that's a pretty fascinating thing to find out, okay, well, she had an affair with the president of the United States. He's still in love with her. Wow. I I really want to tune in Mm -hmm. to episode two and see, see what this is all about. And then in season one, they do explore when she was an intern at the white house and, um, or a new, uh, new hire and, um, you know, how they actually developed their relationship. Um, no. So, yeah, so there's kind of more of a sense of mystery, more to explore about them that makes us curious about them, but it doesn't give us everything. So then would you say – like one of my favorite television shows of all time is Breaking Bad, which mm-hmm. on paper is the worst pitch ever for a television show. Uh, when you well, first... it's it's the best long-term pitch. So yeah, long-term pitch. The but Mr. Chips to Scarface, which, which is, okay, over time, yes. this is going to be a massive character arc. Right. So and so can you kind of break down um, Walter White and how that because that pilot, honestly, uh, I I was listening to Vince Gilligan uh, talk about it. And they said, if you just change a few things that's in release at at Sundance, it's probably one of the greatest independent films of all time (laughs) coming out because it's just so brilliantly done. It was so wonderfully Mm -hmm. done. Um, can you can you talk a little bit about that, or, or do you have enough knowledge about uh, Breaking Bad to, to discuss it a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Well, I break down the pilot in my book, uh, okay. Story Maps TV Drama, so I have okay. a full beat sheet of that, and okay. I and I mention it a lot. Um, okay. So I'm definitely well versed on Breaking Bad. Um, so the the famous pitch was for the show was Mr. Chips to Scarface. So basic boring guy ends up becoming this incredible drug lord who will kill at a moment's notice, you know? Um, and we begin with, he's a high school chemistry teacher. And one of the great things is that motivation that he has cancer. So, and, and the decision to keep it from his family at first. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And he needs money because he, he has, I think he had $7,000 in the bank and he used all of that to buy this RV which they're going to use to cook the meth in. (laughs) So we know he has no money. He has cancer. He needs money. He's a family man. He has a son who has, is it cerebral palsy or something? Yes, yes. Um, So I'm sure that that costs a lot of money. So he has a credible amount of motivation. And to the outside world, he's the nicest guy in the world and the biggest just kind of wimp nebbish. Mm-hmm. And you say, wow, this guy's going to become Scarface. That's that's a journey I want to go on. Now, it's a risk because the executives say, well, wait, he doesn't get there for another three, four seasons. Mm-hmm. And he's not going to get fully into, you know, murderer mode until season five or six. Well, that's a big investment, you know. Um, so it took someone coming off of a couple of hit shows like Vince Gilligan mm-hmm. in order to sell that, you know. I don't know if a completely new writer who just has one pilot is going to be able to sell that pitch, but it's still a great pitch, you know. Right, right, and and it's it took it took a brave company, it took a brave studio to do mm-hmm. it. It took a very and it took them a while to find the audience. It took them a little bit. It took them a couple seasons mm-hmm. before it started to pick up. I didn't pick. I didn't grab onto it till probably around season four. Wow. And season four is when I first like I'd heard about it. I'm like, let me just sit down and start watching. And then I binged it and I mm-hmm. actually got all the way to like half of season five, the last season left. And so wow. I watched the last five or six episodes like everybody else did. But I binged everything up until then. Mm-hmm. It was mm-hmm. such an amazing uh, and it's, such, it's something to study because it's such mm-hmm. a remarkable footnote in in um, in uh, television history, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. For for me, it was just the show that came on. uh, It was either before or after. I think it was after Mad Men. Excuse me, because I was such a huge Mad Men fan. Mm -hmm. It was, oh, what's this show? And I I just started watching it and got sucked into it, you know. And 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 but it doesn't work without Cradston. <laughs> that I mean, mm-hmm. he just was like amazing, <clears throat> amazing in that character. Now, what? Yeah, are- and right there, the casting. <clears throat> excuse me. One second. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the casting was perfect because they casted a guy who was previously known for playing a dorky dad. <laughs> yes, he did. You know. <laughs> yes. 
So we can't imagine him becoming this heartless murderer, you know, right. that was the genius of the casting. They actually, th- they actually said that Malcolm in the Middle was the, um, I think it was the prequel to Breaking <laughs> Bad. And then that Breaking Bad was a bad dream that he wakes up. <laughs> And he's like, what? I thought it was a kingpin or something like that. And they actually <laughs> shot it. They actually shot that scene like that, that Bob Newhart. Uh, it was all oh, a dream. Really? The whole the whole the whole series was a dream. And he wakes up <laughs> in bed with his old wife from Malcolm in the Middle. Like I had this dream. I was a drug kingpin and I killed people. He's like, just go back to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, can you tell me a little bit about story maps and what you're doing with story maps? Mm-hmm. Well, story maps is my structural method that I've written a number of books Um, about. Mm -hmm. And uh, a story map itself is a really powerful outlining tool that breaks down your narrative into its most crucial basic dramatic elements. And then the um, the four to six main story engines and the 10 to 15 major story beats, those signpost beats Mm -hmm. in your plot. Mm -hmm. And you can use the story map to construct a new story a new screenplay, TV pilot, or even even a novel or short story. Mm-hmm. And you can use it to deconstruct an existing narrative, like you know your favorite movie or a bunch of movies from your genre of choice to see how they were done by those professionals or a bunch of TV pilots to help you learn how to write a TV pilot. Um, the great thing that I always suggest and people say, Okay, so structure is so important. Form is so important. Again, it's form, form, not formula. It doesn't dictate your choices. It just um, gives you a shape and a form to put your choices into that's based on uh, years and years of successful structure of films and TV. Excuse me. Wow. Okay, sorry about that. No worries. Um, And so you can not only deconstruct your favorite films and stuff, but you can use them as structural templates. So let's say you want to write a crime genre, crime drama pilot, and you want your main character is going to be a guy from quote, the normal world. Mm -hmm. You could use the breaking bad pilot as your structural template. So you start with breaking it down into a story map, or you get my book story maps, TV drama, the structure Mm -hmm. of the one hour television pilot. Mm-hmm. And you look at that beat sheet for Breaking Bad and you use that as a template to write your own script, at least the first draft. And then you can deviate from that as your story um, demands and allows, you know. So it's a good starting point. It's a great starting point. Yeah. Um, I, I'm a big I'm a big a big proponent of of structure because I feel it, it's like a roadmap for you to kind of like start tossing your characters into and start moving them around. Yeah. And it just keeps you you know, uh, posts along the way of your journey makes Mm -hmm. life a little easier. Yeah. And being, and having come from the world of being a reader on the job for, for studios and production companies and, and, you know, professional companies, I was looking for those structural signposts. You know, Mm -hmm. I was looking for an act one that was around 30 pages. Now, a lot of act ones end exactly on 30 pages and that's great. And I would give them a standing ovation for that. And that would make me feel really great because that was familiar, but it could end on page 29 or 28 or 31 or 32. Mm-hmm. And that would be okay. You know, mm-hmm. as long as it was working in, in every other way. Um, so it doesn't have to exactly be, um, you know, a 30 page act one, Mm -hmm. but you want to have those story beats in there that are the classic story beats that are in 95% of movies. And the thing is that the reader is looking for that. So if you have a 47 page act one, then that reader is going to know their red flag is going to go up and they're going to say, okay, maybe this person doesn't understand structure. Maybe they are overwriting because they're in love with their, with their words, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. And that's when that's when story maps or a structural uh, guy kind of helps you along the way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you can look at these other examples from so many other films, and you can map out your own favorite films and say, okay, well they had a they had an exactly thirty minute act one. Well, there must be something there, you know. If if Christopher Nolan and Steven Spielberg and and Darren Aronofsky had an exact thirty minute act one. And every one of them was working in a different genre. 
there must be something about that 30 minute or 30 page act one. So maybe I should stick within that structure. Mm -hmm. And then once you get three or four or five or 10 or 20 screenplays and you want to start playing around with structure and making Mm -hmm. it a little bit more artistic, that's, that's your provocative. But I think you need to learn the rules before you break them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and even, and in mapping popular films, and scripts, um, you do find little anomalies and things that are interesting. Like I just mapped uh, La La Land. I, I mm-hmm. gave that out as a freebie to my newsletter subscribers. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you want to sign up for that, it's on. It's at act4screenplays.com. I'll put it in the show notes. Okay, cool. Um, so uh, I mapped out La La Land, and I originally had the turn, the end of Act One turn, coming right at 30 minutes. Because that that thirty minute arc is when they're at the party and she she's mocked him because she sees him in the eighties the eighties cover band right and he had previously always thought he was such a serious musician and she sees him in this cheesy eighties cover band and he confronts her they argue and he says all right I'll see you in the movies and he stalks off and that's like exactly thirty minutes and so I thought okay well that's the end of Act One but I ended up changing the end of Act One to 25 minutes and I'm trying to remember what was the moment um I don't quite remember what the moment was but it was um it was an earlier moment which I felt really capped off act one it was them oh it was the moment when she we we see we finally realized the fruition of what she was looking at when she heard that enchanting uh jazz music piano music and she comes into the club and we originally had just seen her eyes looking off camera, you know, really entranced, and then we cut away. So now we come back 10 minutes later and we see what she was looking at and it's him at the piano. So it's that big moment where um, they already had their quote, meet cute, which was her flipping him off, you know, on, right. in, in the, the traffic. And lovely um, LA traffic, yes. Yeah, yeah, but, um, but this was really the fruition of them, the first moment of them romantically coming together. So I said, you know what? This was a 25 minute act one, um, which may not sound like that big of a deal, but mm-hmm. when 90, 95% of act ones are around 30 minutes, mm-hmm. to change that by five minutes, it can actually kind of be a big deal sometimes. Depending on the story. Mm-hmm, depending on the story. So now I'm going to talk, ask you a, a couple of questions I ask all of my uh, all of my guests. So, uh, what okay. advice would you give a screenwriter wanting to break into the business? Okay, um, does it have to be one piece of advice? You can or? give two or three. <laughs> Go for it. Okay. Well, um, read as many scripts as possible that you can get your hands on. Um, you can download a lot of them online. You probably have friends that can send you the PDFs. Mm-hmm. read as many scripts as possible, professional scripts and break down or story map as many films as possible to really see how the professionals do it. You know, use those as templates. Don't just watch movies and think about them. Do written analysis of the movies, even do your own coverage reports, you know, do a, do a page or two of actual notes, um, commentary, critique of an actual film. Um, And maybe you want to take that professionally and become a reader, you know, but do written analysis, whether it's a beat sheet or your own little essay about a film, because it forces you to really take it apart, you know, to really think about that. Okay, where is the end of act one? Is it 25 minutes or is it 30 minutes? Um, And if you force yourself to decide on that and map it out, then you're really going to see how how these things work and really take them apart and see how they run. Perfect. Now, can you tell me, uh, can you tell me what book had the biggest impact on your life or career besides story maps, of course? Yes. Um, (laughs) you know, I have to go back to Sid Field's screenplay because I got that. I can't remember. I think it was my senior year of high school, actually. Um, I think my mom found it or something. And, uh, and that just was my, the first, time I even learned about 
feature film screenplay structure, you know, so that just really blew the doors open for me. Same here. When I read that book in college, I was just, my mind was blown. I'm like, what? Every movie is the same? What? It just, Mm -hmm. it it kind of blew my mind as well. Mm -hmm. Um, What is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Wow. Um, Well, it's funny. I will say something that I'm learning now is I'm pursuing more the independent route um, Mm -hmm. with my own scripts and pilots. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm working with friends to ideally produce my own work. You know, we're Mm -hmm. still in the development stage, but because it is really hard to, if you only have a script to convince that studio, production company, network, uh, agency, whatever, to take a chance on you because it's just a script. You know, you don't have actors attached. You don't have financing behind you. You don't have a director attached. Audien- um, an audience built up, anything. An audience built up, a track record. So I think I'm coming to the point where I'm just like, you know what? Got to do it yourself, you know? Um, and I've been getting that note for the past 10 years, mm-hmm. even more, you know, especially with the dawn of YouTube mm-hmm. and all these streaming streaming services. Mm-hmm. Everyone keeps saying, do it yourself, do it yourself. You know, you, you can get your hands on a camera that's, that's cinema quality. If, if an iPhone can shoot a movie now, anybody can shoot a movie, you know. Mm-hmm. Now, the problem with that is anybody can shoot a bad movie that's unprofessional and never sells, you yes. know, and maybe goes to... 10 film festivals and you have to pay to travel to 10 film festivals. And before you're done, you're $20,000 in debt. But, you know, let's look on the bright side and say, you're going to make a good movie. You know, that is going to go somewhere or it's just going to become your, your sizzle reel or resume to get you a good manager and a good agent and really get you moving. But I would say, um, it's the do it yourself thing, you know? Um, a script, a single great, awesome script should be enough, mm-hmm. but the reality is it's so competitive that it isn't always enough. I mean, the black but, the blacklist is a good example of that. How many amazing uh-huh. scripts are on the blacklist, and it's still hard. Yeah, it's still hard for them to get produced. Mm-hmm. You know, um, but the only thing that you ha- the only thing you need. The requirement you need to start is a great script, okay? So if you're going <laughs> to produce it yourself for $10,000 and shoot it with your iPhone, you still need a great script. If you're going to sell it to Warner Brothers for $100,000, you still need a great script. You know, If you're going to attach an indie producer who has a track record who won Sundance, you still need a great script. And that means you're going to have to spend years developing your craft, you know? Mm-hmm. Well said, sir. Well said. Now, what are three of your favorite films of all time? Well, uh, that's interesting because I have, I always say my two favorite, I can't choose which is my, I can't choose which is my number one favorite film. Mm -hmm. So I actually have three favorite films. They are Raiders of the Lost Ark, Goodfellas, and The Wizard of Oz. Great combo. They're Incredibly different films. I mean, you can't get any more different. <laughs> you think? <laughs> but uh, but they're so different, you know. I mean, they're so amazing that those are kind of my top three spots. And depending on how I'm feeling at the moment, one of them may be number one or they may all three be number one. But yeah. Got, got it. They're amazing. Now, where can people find you and your work? Well, you can find me at act screenplays.com. That's mm-hmm. my homepage. And that is A-C-T-F-O-U-R screenplays.com. And you can learn about my consulting and you can get my books and you can get a lot of um, free advice and downloads and things like that. Um, you can also sign up for my newsletter there. And I give out um, exclusive articles, sometimes leads from producers and sometimes free story maps through my newsletter. Mm -hmm. So um, you can learn about that. You can also learn about my story maps masterclass, which is an eight week program. It begins with an eight week program where you develop a TV pilot or a feature Mm -hmm. from the ground up, from concept and log line straight through to a finished draft. Mm -hmm. Uh, You probably won't finish the eight weeks with a finished draft, but you'll definitely be on your way. You'll probably finish with 
a rock solid story map, a great scene list, you know, comprehensive scene list and the first 10 to 30 pages of your screenplay. So then from there, you're armed to, to you're well on your way to creating a great script. And what's unique about my masterclass is that I bring in professionals to actually give advice on your log lines and to actually do Q&A conference calls with my writers to give them career advice as well. That's awesome. So let's say you're workshopping two log lines. You're not sure which one you're going to write. I'm going to give you notes. Um, if it's a group class, your peers will give you notes. And then these two industry professionals, like right now I have a former studio executive who was at the studio level. He was involved with films like Groundhog Day, Great movie. Uh, the Lord of the Rings, you know, so he was a really top uh, like president of marketing at big companies like New Line and MGM. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I have um, a very successful screenwriter, uh, Jeffrey Reddick, who is responsible for the Final Destination franchise. He's big mm -hmm. in thrillers and horror. So these guys are going to give notes on concepts uh, from my writers for my next uh, for my next class. Mm -hmm. um, awesome. So you get this feedback from these people who are executives, managers, assistants to agents, screenwriters. They've been in the business for a long time and they say, you know what, this first log line sounds interesting, but this is more of a passion piece. This is not something that in the current marketplace from a newbie is really going to go anywhere. But this second log line feels more commercial to me, although you maybe don't have all the elements worked out yet. So then you have this information and you're going to decide whether you want to go with the first concept for the second concept. Very cool. Very so it really cool. helps. Well, Dan, man, thank you so much for being on the show. I, you've, you've dropped a bunch of knowledge bombs on uh, the Indie Film Hustle tribe, so I truly appreciate your time. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me on. My goal was to drop knowledge bombs. <laughs> and you did, sir. Hopefully thank that you. Was, that was achieved. <laughs> I want to thank Dan for coming on and dropping those knowledge bombs on us. And I hope you guys got something out of it, you know, after he's been reading just thousands of screenplays over the course of his career. I think he has a decent grasp on story. And uh, if you guys want to check out his books, just head over to the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 201. Now, you guys know every year around Black Friday, we do crazy sales with all of our online courses. And this year is no exception. Right now, all of our Udemy courses are out there for $10. And it's only going to be that way for this week, Black Friday week. So go to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash U-D-E-M-Y, Udemy. And there you're going to have access to all of our courses. We have over 12 courses on Udemy, but then you have access to all of Udemy's thousands of courses about every topic you can imagine. So take advantage of this, guys. I've already bought a few courses that I've been eyeing for a while as well. So definitely check it out, IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash Udemy. And I want to thank all of the tribe members who I've been doing consulting sessions with on Skype for my new show, The Ask Alex Show, which is going to be coming out in January. And by the way, we're going to do 31 episodes in a row. It's going to be epic. <laughs> so every day you're going to get a brand new episode, brand new question answered, and we're going to do it for 31 days, the entire month of January. And then afterwards, we'll see how big of a hit it is. If people really like it, if you guys really want more, I'll do more, not at that pace, of course, but maybe I'll, I'll start a new weekly show that will just be doing that and, and reaching out to uh, the tribe. And, and, I, and I, in all honesty, I have had such a ball talking to all of the tribe members that have already been on the show uh, answering those questions, really connecting, and uh, finding out what I could do better in the future for Indie Film Hustle, and also serving and being able to help people on their journey and filmmakers on their journey. So for all of the uh, filmmakers that have already spoken to me, thank you so much. It was an absolute pleasure and honor to speak to you and help you on your journey. And then I have a bunch more coming up. And if you guys want to get on the list to see if you can get on the show, just email me at ifhsubmissions at gmail.com and we'll see if we can schedule you guys in and one last thing before i go i know a, a while ago i had a contest the stephen pressfield contest to uh see if i could get letters from the tribe explaining how they are battling resistance and the thing that stops them from being creative and i got inundated with a lot of letters and stories and i want to thank everybody who sent them in uh, and I've been so slow to get back to everybody about this because I have been, as you can imagine, 
fairly busy. I do all of this by myself. So it's hard for me to be able to do everything. But I finally sat down over the weekend and went through everybody. And I've got a list of winners that are going to be getting books. They've all been sent out already. So hopefully you guys will get them uh, in the States uh, or in, in Canada. You should be getting them hopefully within a week or two. Um, and then overseas might take a little longer. But here are the list of winners of the Stephen Pressfield contest. Alfonso Menendez, Melissa, and I, I can't, please forgive me, Skelachkilgi, Gail, sorry, I'm so sorry, uh, Kenny uh, Selven, Selvinson, of course, Kenny, uh, who's also going to be on the show for uh, the Alex Ask, Ask Alex show, Jonathan Cutler, Jake Richardson, John Hale, Mario Ferrito, and Justin Schneider. All of you guys have won books and a little extra surprise that I threw in for every one of you guys in the package. So please, if once you guys get these packages, if you can take a picture of it, of, of the you guys, you know, opening up the package, a video, whatever, send it to me and I will post it all over the place. So thank you again for everyone who submitted. And um, I was truly humbled and honored to read your stories. And there was so much love and so much so, you know, just hope in those stories. So I really thank you again for sharing your stories with me. And after such a wonderful response, we are going to do another contest. That's right, another contest. Uh, I spoke to Stephen Pressfield and he said that if you want some more books, we'll give you some more books because the re response was so wonderful. So uh, in the show notes, I will leave the address to ship another letter. I need you guys to send a physical letter telling me the story of why you are, how you're fighting resistance, how you're fighting that thing that stops you from moving forward on your journey. And I'll, I'll be only going to be able to give away a handful more because um, I can't keep asking Stephen for more books. But uh, but I do have some more uh, access to some more and and I want to give them away to you guys. So please uh, head to the show notes in nephilmonster.com forward slash 201. And I look forward to reading your stories, guys. Thank you again so much. Again, happy Turkey Day for all my U.S. listeners. And as always, keep that hustle going, keep that dream alive, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. 